All right, welcome to chapter four, where we're going to talk about basically DNA replication, okay, continuity, and then mutations, variation within the genome. All right, so kind of a brief overview of what we're going to cover in this chapter. Um, DNA replication and repair are processes carried out in the cell by enzymes, coded for by DNA. And these processes and therefore the proteins in the genes are highly conserved among organisms. Okay. During DNA replication, the DNA sequence of each strand is used as a template to make a new strand, also called semi-conservative replication. So this copying process allows the continuity, uh, but mutations can happen and can be passed along in the, um, during the replication process. Okay. So we have continuity, but with change. So these changes arising either during or after replication are called mutations. Any change to the DNA there, they could be deleterious, they could be advantageous, they could just be neutral in terms of uh, how they affect the organism. So a lot of these mutations that arise from errors or DNA damage can be repaired. There are systems for that. But in spite of uh, replication fidelity and these repair mechanisms, these nucleotide changes accumulate over time in the DNA of the organism. And the number of changes in those nucleotide sequence can reflect the time since the sequences are present elsewhere. And so you can reconstruct uh, the evolutionary lineage of organisms by looking at the changes that have accumulated over time in the DNA sequences. So this is the idea of descent with modification. Okay, so Darwin observed this phenomena where descendants are similar but not identical to the parents, and that's where this phrase came from, the idea that you have sort of an ancestor that a lot of um, things are derived from and that there will be similarities between the offspring but also significant changes. Okay, so fitness, we're going to use the biological term, doesn't mean like workouts and such, or strength or, you know, survival of the, the fittest and the idea that the strong overlay the weak. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that an organism's fitness is the fact that it survived to reproducing age and then it had children who then went on to have lots of grandchildren. So your fitness is surviving to reproduce and then how well you reproduce, okay? So in a successful population, you have this balance of accumulating uh, interesting changes while not accumulating too many um, bad changes. Okay. So successive generations will have more variants, which some could be adapted for, for uh, let's say, colonizing a new niche or resistant to a pathogen. You will lose, have some that have um, deleterious variants that can't carry out essential processes, but um, too much variation and everything goes haywild, not enough variation, and you stagnate and you're not able to adapt to, say, changing environment or a new disease. And this all comes down to, you know, DNA. The structure of DNA is what really allows it to be replicated and passed on and such. So it becomes very critical to understanding genetics is, is understanding uh, DNA. Okay, so we've got our base pairing here. We've got adenine and thymine that pair with two hydrogen bonds. Let me grab my little laser pointer. This guy right up here, we got two hydrogen bonds there. Okay. And then we have cytosine and guanine that pair with three hydrogen bonds. So it's slightly more stable and harder to pull apart. The idea of semi-conservative replication is that we have our original helix that pulls apart. We have the black letters here in the original helix, okay? That opens up. You have one original strand uses a template here with a newly synthesized strand occurring. The other side is used as the template for another synthesized strand, and that's how you duplicate your DNA, okay? Semi-conservative replication. And so this was demonstrated by Messelson and Stahl uh, because this is in the era of when people weren't sure if protein was the information carrier molecule or if it was something else. People didn't quite know what nucleic acids were doing or what they were for. But they basically used uh, different isotopes of nitrogen, uh, DNA built with either nitrogen 15 or nitrogen 14 and loaded them into this centrifuge and then um, in the cesium chloride solution that we use, the um, DNA would float to a specific area. And so 
nitrogen 14 is, is slightly lighter than nitrogen 15, so the band is uh, higher up in the tube, whereas the heavier nitrogen 15 forms a band at a lower end of the tube. And they were able to see that when you um, put, uh, say, you only had nitrogen 14 containing bacteria, if you gave them nitrogen 15 to build their DNA with, over time you would see that both the nitrogen 14 and the nitrogen 15 show up in the DNA uh, in the bands here. You have two separate bands, one for 14, one for 15, as the DNA were the bacteria were incorporating that nitrogen into their DNA over time. So DNA can dissociate, okay? It can um, pull apart into the single strands and then it can re-anneal. Uh, so this dissociation is called denaturing usually. And then we have denature, and then we have either um, renature or anneal in order to bring them back together. Okay, so sort of this is the broad overview of replication here, that we have our original strand uh, being unzipped or pulled apart by helicase, okay? And then we have over here, one of the original strands is getting um, replicated in the five prime to three prime direction just continuously. The other strand, this other strand is, has to be sort of replicated in chunks, okay? So each strand is a template for synthesizing a new DNA strand. Um, and DNA polymerase, so the um, DNA is being made into a polymer and then the ascending shows you its enzyme. The DNA polymerase is what is building the new DNA strands. So DNA polymerase is limited. It can only add bases at the three prime end of the DNA molecule. So we say that DNA is synthesized in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay, so DNA polymerase is gonna add um, the five prime carbon in the ribose molecule to the three prime carbon in the previous molecule here. There are multiple DNA polymerases. The bacterial polymerases are um, shown via Roman numerals, where with pole three, uh, DNA polymerase three, doing most of the DNA replication in bacteria. In eukaryotes, we use Greek letters, alpha, data, delta, epsilon, and um, beta, lambda, the Greek letters to signify the eukaryotic polymerases. Okay. And they have different roles. There are different polymerases for different tasks. Um, it's just the DNA replication, processing Okazaki fragments and repair are all carried out by um, mostly different uh, polymerases, although some of the eukaryotic polymerases do double shift. So there are specific spots on the DNA um, strand where replication is starts and begins called origins of replication. Okay. In bacteria, there's just one single origin as the chromosome is a big loop. So it starts, opens, and folds out, and you have the two replication forks here that progress around until the entire um, circular chromosome is replicated. And eukaryotic chromosomes are so huge, there are multiple origins of replication within the linear chromosome. So they sort of make these little replication bubbles and move outwards until they meet. And you have two um, replicated DNA strands. So there's a suite of proteins that help uh, DNA replication along, uh, starting with DNA helicase uh, that spreads the DNA strands apart so that polymerase can get in there and start doing its job. The topoisomerases uh, help unwind and reduce the torsion in the um, DNA strands sort of ahead of the uh, helicase. Single-stranded binding proteins attach to the newly opened DNA strands and keep them from reattaching until they can get loaded into DNA polymerase. The origin binding proteins um, basically bind to the origin of replication and sort of help DNA helicase assemble onto the strands. The clamp loader and the sliding clamp keep the DNA uh, flowing in the right direction for the polymerase to, to work on. And then DNA ligase goes in after replication and seals the NICs in the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA strands. So when we start replication, um, the topoisomerases have helped DNA helicase onto the strand and it separates the two DNA strands. And then we have our single strand binding proteins sort of latching on to keep the strands apart. And then there's other proteins. Uh, this is pretty complex in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, but we're not going to get into the massive amounts of detail. Make sure that the DNA is moving along and that the replication fork stays open. Okay, so here's sort of a uh, electron 
micrograph of the replication fork. So there's a whole bunch of um, a sort of a protein assemblage here of enzymes that are keeping the DNA strands open and helping replication progress. So in order for replication to occur and work properly, there's five main challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, the first one being, how does polymerase actually get started? Okay, challenge one, how do we get both strands replicated in the correct direction, since polymerase can only move in one direction? Uh, what keeps the DNA from being tangled? Uh, challenge four is, how do you deal with the ends of the DNA strand? And then challenge five is, how do you ensure that the replication is actually accurate? How do you keep things uh, clean and precise? So the first challenge we have is that DNA polymerase actually needs a double-stranded section of DNA to get started. It can't just start with a single strand. So polymerase gets started um, because another enzyme called RNA primase comes in and adds a section of RNA to the DNA strand, making it double-stranded. Okay, so this primase initiates the replication because it doesn't care about having a um, three prime OH end to connect to. It can just take a single strand and add double strand. Okay. So this little primer is built um, complementary to the template DNA. And now you have a three prime end. Let me grab my little pointer. The three prime end here is now what the uh, DNA polymerase can latch onto. So a little helping hand via RNA primase there. So now our challenge, uh, RNA primase comes in and lays down a primer, but how are both strands replicated in the right direction? Because only one of them actually has an open three prime end uh, for RNA polymerase to continuously work on. So this section here going in the opposite direction, we have a five prime end hanging out that RNA polymerase can't do anything with. So the solution to this is that even though the strands are anti-parallel and you can only extend in the five prime to three prime direction, and that replication fork is moving away from the newly replicated DNA, we can synthesize these strands. So we can fix this. Uh, the leading strand has no problem because it's replicating continuously. It's got a nice little open three prime end for um, uh, DNA polymerase to work on. And then the other side is discontinuous. It's in short fragments. RNA primase will basically come in and keep adding little RNA primers so that there's a three prime end for DNA polymerase to work on. So this leaves little fragments of RNA in between sections of DNA, but hey, we've got a strand replicated and there's going to be an enzyme that comes along and fixes that later. Okay. So the lagging strand, these little short segments that are, that are made on the lagging strand that DNA polymerase can come in and work on are called Okazaki fragments for the couple that uh, discovered them. Okay. And then uh, DNA polymerase can come in, fill those gaps, excise the RNA, prime, uh, RNA primer and uh, replace it with DNA. And then DNA ligase comes in and seals those nicks in the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay. Yay, DNA ligase, it's fantastic. Our third challenge is the unwinding problem. The fact that we've got a helix here, it's not actually just two straight lines, it's uh, pretty coiled. And that's where our topo isomerases come in and they uh, reduce the tension in the DNA strand ahead of the replication fork. Okay. We relieve the super coiling of the DNA. Okay, they actually cut the DNA open and then reseal it back up <coughs> in order to do this. And so without that, we have, if you knock out a gene for topo isomerases, you see that the cells can't um, uh, duplicate their DNA because of the tangling. It's kind of interesting suite of experiments. Now the end replication problem uh, here is that uh, when you take out your RNA primer there, you have this gap and the five prime end DNA polymerase uh, can't really deal with that. So what do you do with this little odd gap at the end of your chromosome because if you don't fill that gap uh, you're going to just every time this the DNA is replicated you're going to lose information during each copy cycle okay okay so what do we do with the ends of the chromosome with this oh, five prime a carbon that DNA polymerase can't lat latch onto so the solution here is that these ends um, the very far ends don't contain a whole lot of coding information they have these repeating sequences that's complementary to this uh, RNA in the uh, telomerase enzyme here. And this, so this enzyme can pop on, sort of match itself to that 
repeated section, it will build a new uh, section of RNA off the end of the chromosome. Okay, And then it will move to that section, build another section off the end of the chromosome to the right there, and you get this nice uh, strip of DNA-RNA kind of hybrid Okay, so that we have this long complementary sequence up on top. And then what will happen is with enough time there, an RNA uh, polymerase can latch on and start adding some uh, RNA to this end. And then now DNA polymerase has a three prime sugar down on this end here that it can latch on to and synthesize back towards the center of the chromosome. And then since you've extended this, you can degrade that last RNA primer and um, eventually you'll be able to extend it some more. This way, this is the cell's way of protecting the important uh, coding sequences towards the middle of the chromosome.